So I said before that there were sort of two lines of identification or of identity and social organization, and one was sort of by geography, right? Grouping people together based on where they lived. And the other was by kinship. And a lot of times those overlapped. And since we've already had such a good lecture um, in the reading materials about from Dr. Boris about clan, and then I also covered some things about clan, and you also did a reading about clan, I'm not going to spend a lot of time other than just to remind us, again, matrilineal exogamous group. If you're having a hard time remembering exogamous, um, forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but exo as an exoskeleton, right, the outside of a bug, so exogamous meaning married outside of your group. Um, these clans, there are, you'll see different sources that'll say 9 or 10 or 11. Part of what's going on there, and the reason that that's not precisely known, is because knowledge was starting to be lost, even by the time the anthropologists were writing in the 30s and the 60s. Um, people were starting to find it difficult to remember some of the clans they were still really clear on, and some of the clans people weren't as clear on. Um, that could would probably reflect a number of things, one of which is just if some clans were disappearing out, which can happen in any clan system, even if there's not colonialism, um, if people end up marrying out of the clan and not into the clan at the same rates, but especially under something like traumatic colonialism or the huge population loss as a result of smallpox in the early 1800s, sorry, mid 1800s. There was just tremendous population loss, particularly on the Kenai Peninsula. And so in a situation like that, um, it's really tragic and you're going to understand another reason why some of this knowledge would be lost or some of these clans there might be far fewer members of them or none at all and so the knowledge might start to be lost um, but in theory at the beginning there was nine to ten or maybe eleven and again divided as two moieties kind of two halves of the society and a clan generally the idea would be that you would share kind of a common origin story and typically a common ancestor uh, perhaps that there might be a sacred story about so for example that reading by peter kalifornsky about the denina clans he talks about sky clan coming about um, having originally been on sort of an island um, on top of a mountain or even further up in the sky so clans is people sharing a common origin story and often an ancestor and in denina society often living close to each other in a village although not always um, and again, divided into broader moieties. Um, I wanted to point out really quickly that clans and moieties, in addition to the kinship functions that we've already talked about, they also had a political function and an economic function, or at least those are the terms we'd use for them nowadays, right? Again, this is showing sort of how differentiated English and Anglo-influenced culture is, right? That we have different terms for all this. Um, in traditional Denina society, a lot of these things were holistically intertwined. Uh, but clans and moieties controlled a lot of things. One was um, ownership of certain fishing spots was controlled by a clan or a moiety. Um, another, and so there's this kind of like fundamental economic function, like that's our fishing spot. Uh, and if you want to use that fishing spot, you would need to talk to the people from that clan. There was also other kinds of clan or moiety ownership and one of them is something that we don't always think of as being owned uh, nowadays, which is song ownership. So people would craft elaborate songs, um, especially for something like a potlatch. There would be specific kinds of morning songs, but other songs as well, things people would share around the fire, for example, or different things. Um, and these were owned oftentimes by a moiety or by a clan and that belonged to them. Um, this is a graphic from one of Alan Boris's lectures, and it just kind of shows a lot of what I was just talking about. We don't need to go into all the details. You don't need to memorize all this, especially because a lot of this we haven't even talked about yet. But I kind of want to focus on specifically here the idea that each village had its chief, its leaders, its hunting chief, as well as the clan helpers, right? What they're calling the commoners, but I, I would just say the villagers, right? The followers. And they would be connected typically to different villages or connected uh, through this slow sin relationship where the Keshkas in two different villages are connected together. And then these two villages are often interacting through big potlatch when somebody passes away, um, sometimes through marrying out to each other because they're opposite moieties, um, sometimes through things like a little potlatch, which would be a celebration for smaller events but still significant ones like for example a birth uh, or like for example brothers being reunited after a long time so there was this sort of interweaving of these two villages that i find really really fascinating all right well now i kind of want to shift gears a little bit we've talked about geography we've talked about kinship i now want to talk about three final things having to do with relations in a society and how traditional denina society handled them so three big issues 
you know, we could list a dozen big issues, but here's three. What happens when a relative dies? Right, what do we do about death? Um, death is a physical problem in a sense for a human group as it is for any species, right? When you, the, any social species, when you lose a member, that's potentially an issue. But more importantly, it's a, it's a social issue for human beings. It's a psychological issue, it's an emotional issue, and it's a social issue. What do you do about the loss of a member, right? In that sort of gaping hole, both in your life and also in the village, right? Um, another question is, how do you deal so we've talked about social order. As far as we can tell, Denina societies, there was never war between Denina societies that we have a good record of, at least not until sort of modern times in the disruptions of um, colonialism. You'll hear about things like shaman wars once Russian colonialism was happening, but even that's not really war between villages. It's more war between shamans. Um, but generally speaking, Denina villages didn't go to war with each other. And as far as we can tell, generally speaking, Denina villages or bands also didn't go to war with their surrounding Athabascan neighbors, um, such as the Koyukon or the Anna. But there was war. And so what do you do when people outside the social group may be antagonistic or you're antagonistic towards them or just there's antagonism? How is that handled? And then finally, how do you make sure people just generally follow rules and get along. So we've talked about some of those ways, right? You had a shock as a mediator, you had a clan relationship, a group of people teaching you how to live your life, and a group of a family that presumably has expectations for you. We'll talk about that more in a minute. So let's start with the last one first, social order. How do you make sure people sort of follow the rules when there's not something, again, like a codified set of laws or like a police force or something? Um, well, you know, the biggest thing is just common values, right? So if you go to, um, hopefully this works. Thanks, Google. Actually, thanks, Bing. Man, that's surprising. Um, so anyways, this is um, from Canaanite's Indian tribe. They have a list of values important in uh, Denina traditional society. They talk about ancestors, one spirit, the right way, the truth, ada, care, concern, nadesnaka, our elders. And you can go through those um, other ones like respect for animals and plants, uh, fellowship, right? Being a good friend, um, honesty, not that. Uh, um, as we look at these, right, we see a list of values of how to be a responsible member of society, how to love other people, how to take care of people that may be both very knowledgeable, but also sometimes in some societies very vulnerable, right? Um, how to care for them, um, the emphasis on our youngest and most vulnerable members, the emphasis on a lineage that you have responsibilities towards. Um, in There's so much in our modern society of sort of individualism um, and the sort of autonomy of the individual that it can sometimes be hard to wrap our mind around this idea of sort of a obligation to a kinship, an obligation to a lineage, for some of us that might seem really natural, for some of us that might seem a little foreign, uh, but certainly was a guiding value in Denina society, and is a guiding value in Denina society. But my point with this is that there's a set of norms and values, and that was expressed one way on the Kanaitsi Indian Tribes website, it could be expressed other ways by different um, tribes and different elders, but the idea is a set of ideals of what it means to be a proper person in this society, and that common set of norms and values, when you have a group of people in a village that are essentially sharing in the same cultural tradition, the same storytelling, the same discourses, the same teachings of Gashka, right? It makes a really powerful, um, what Greg Urban calls a discourse history, right? A bunch of sayings and ideas that we've been exposed to over our life that shape how we feel and think. Uh, and you'd be surprised how much social order can be maintained just by people sort of having common values. Uh, other things as well, you know, sometimes even with common values, conflict happens, crap happens, and so there's a variety of ways to deal with that. Um, one was through council, and so there was the Geshka as sort of a leader and mediator, but a lot of decisions got made by the village as a whole through council, um, sometimes formal, um, sometimes perhaps less formal. There's debate about how often these were called. Some sources make it sound like people met as a village council all the time, others make it sound like it was pretty rare, but that was an op option that the entire village meet to discuss a complex issue. Um, there's informal sanctions, 
So when we talk about sanctions in this context, what we mean is things that society, members of a society where they're using social power to coerce or maybe just influence other people to follow the rules. And so gossip, right, as with any village-based society, um, avoidance, right, people choosing not to spend time around people that are acting in really antisocial and maybe rude or conflictual ways. I put joking with a question mark here because although none of, uh, I've never heard specifically about denying a joking as a way of sort of social control, that's so common in so many societies, including across vast areas of Native North America, um, that it would be surprising if that wasn't the case in traditional Dena'ina society. I just haven't read any great ethnographic information about it. But in many, many small-scale societies, by which I mean not like state societies, society, not like aggressive empire societies or huge city societies, and many smaller-scale societies, um, joking is an important way in which people communicate to each other what's good behavior and what's not in a way that's perhaps less high stakes than an actual physical fight, but still gets the point across. Um, there was other things as well. Um, supernatural sanctions, a sense that bad behavior could potentially cause um, bad results from a broader spiritual realm, and we'll talk about that more later in the semester um, when we talk about denying a spiritual beliefs, but a good example of this is you have a lot of several Dena'ina stories where you have somebody that's sort of not believing in the ways of the elders or not believing in the ways of the Kechaltani, the true believers, right? Not believing the stories. And then they go about, as one example, uh, you have this story where this guy is um, hurting mice over and over and over again uh, and doesn't really care about treating them respectfully and is just like throwing them outside the camp, right? Disposing of their bodies in a very disrespectful and indeed sacrilegious way in this cultural context. And then you know, people like that having, he has a dream, right, in which he sees um, Kunta Jalen, the mother of all things, over and over again um, as this beautiful woman, but then she turns and she's like, got this like ugly look on her face, or this ugliness, um, so kind of, he has this like scary dream, and then he comes back to the village and kind of um, owns up to his mistakes and teaches people, we gotta listen to like the ways of the Ketjeltani, and so supernatural sanctions as another idea of ways of social order, either people directly experiencing that or at least people hearing stories of that. Um, potlatches, where you could put the big potlatches, remembering the good that was done by the deceased is often a way of telling other people in the society we ought to behave a certain way, as well as the little potlatches as well. Um, this was, Potlatches also served an important function in sort of shuffling um, gifts around and gift giving can often be a way in which social relationships are strengthened, right? You give a gift, you're showing that you remembered and that you cared. And oftentimes when you give a gift, there's then sort of an obligation, as Marcel Mauss famously said, to give the gift back, right? The spirit of the gift. And indeed in potlatches, a lot of times there was an exchange, right? People would uh, be giving gifts back and forth between moieties. That's another way of sort of binding people together. Um, this sort of back and forth feasting, giving feasts, celebrating together, giving gifts. And I wanted to make kind of a final, perhaps slightly grim note, uh, which is how to deal with murder in a society like this, right? So if there's, again, no um, codified law, no police force, what do you do about murder? Uh, as far as we can tell from the traditional sources, a couple of things. One, murder was probably not very common for a lot of reasons, uh, just in general in small-scale societies. That's not something um, within a village that people are going to want to do a lot, right? These are sort of your natural allies and people that you're working with and that you care about and that you see every day. Um, there was also the sense, though, in the society that if murder did happen, there was a kind of concept, traditionally, as far as we can tell um, from what Osgood said, that somebody, if somebody murdered um, somebody from, say, somebody from Clan A murders somebody from Clan B, some people in Clan B, the relatives of the person that died, could then take revenge. But they could take revenge against the killer, but they could also take revenge against just like any random member of Clan A, right? So if you, if somebody killed somebody, they were opening up not just themselves up to revenge, to retribution, to death, they were opening up their entire clan up to that, right? They were opening up 
perhaps a cousin, perhaps a sibling, perhaps a parent. You can understand how even in the most heated of situations, how that might act as a very strong social deterrent to people um, doing the terrible act of murder, right? If the, it's one thing to put one's own life in danger, it's another thing entirely to put random members of one's clan up for danger that, you know, that the retribution might be taken on, out on another person, not you, but somebody else in your society, right? Um, so, yeah. Death is another thing. How do you honor the dead in such a way that you honor the, the role people filled? Um, There's a lot of different practices related to this in traditional Dinaina society. Uh, cremation was very, very common. Typically, that was how people um, dealt with the bodies of the dead. Um, it was... We'll talk a little bit later in this semester about kind of the interesting ways that that changed once Russian Orthodoxy and Christianity generally entered into the area, particularly because Russian Orthodox priests discouraged cremation. So we'll talk about that more later. Um, there was oftentimes pretty elaborate mourning practices um, by the relatives of the deceased. Again, large potlatches. Uh, part of the idea with the big potlatch is that people's spirit even after their bodies have been cremated, that people's spirit potentially, or it's kind of multiple different spirit concepts in Tanina spirituality, uh, but in this sense, kind of a shadow soul, kind of a, a, a part of you, a spiritual part of you, that that could remain behind, particularly if people had um, sort of not left in a good way or if there was unresolved issues at home. And so that the spirit needed to be, um, Alan Boris says, propitiated, a propitiation, that's a common anthropological term for this. Uh, I think that's a good term for this. I also like perhaps instead the term resolution, right? Helping the dead find resolution. Either way, the potlatch serves as a way of sort of honoring them. People sing songs about them, sometimes of their own creation, sometimes standardized mourning songs that the clan owns. Uh, pe the Geshka gives a long speech about the deceased. All in all, the deceased is properly honored and allowed to continue on their journey. Um, and then people's possessions were very often burned with them, actually. That's an interesting thing to point out because um, it is one of many reasons, again, back to this concept we talked about a couple weeks ago, that Denina villages, at least pre-colonialism, oftentimes did not have as many artifacts, or the artifacts might be very hard to find because quite a few of the artifacts would have been burnt, right? things that were burnable, like wood material. Um, that's obviously not the case with stone things. They wouldn't be able to be burned. A final point is warfare. So um, there appears to have not been like major warfare as far, we don't have record of like major warfare um, between different groups in Cook Inlet. Um, there's speculation about what became of the river in Kachemak and um, how that all went down, but I don't think anybody proposes that it was some kind of major warfare. And certainly by the time we're entering in sort of the traditional time period of sort of, you know, 1200 to 1800, not really any good reason to believe that there was extensive warfare. Um, people in societies that are relatively small scale or foraging societies, there's not typically a lot of impulse and there certainly wasn't here to sort of aggressively grab other people's territories, especially when we're talking about coastal regions where resources are really abundant. It's not as if, you know, people couldn't find their own place to make a living. So there wasn't a lot of like aggressive war. There did seem to be some minor warfare though with Yupik communities that were nearby on the, um, northwestern side of Cook Inlet, and then also with Alutic uh, communities, particularly coming from Kodiak Island or the Alaska Peninsula, what we think of as the Koniag sort of zone of Alutic people or Shukpiak people. Um, that So Osgood gives an explanation for this. Others have given an explanation for this. I want to stress that this would be, since they interviewed Denina people from the perspective of Denina people, as opposed to from the perspective of Yupik or Alutic people. Um, but the perspective from those interviewed about warfare was that sometimes Yupik and Alutic people would, they would want furs from Dedina people who had access to caribou and other sorts of um, fur-bearing animals to a better degree than you would on smaller islands, right, or something like that, or more on the coastal areas. And so more access to caribou, more access to other fur bearers, and also access to interior Athabascan tribes where they could trade for furs. And so then the Denina have these furs, um, but 
if sometimes they would trade with surrounding you pick in other tick communities but sometimes they wouldn't right because we don't need what you have if you have fish we have fish but we have furs and you want the furs and that would sometimes escalate into a raiding behavior with where you pick or alutic would raid denino villages to get furs um, but of course it would be a violent raid to take somebody's furs from them you would have to attack them as well um, that's the story i have no idea how, uh, if that's the case or how we would ever prove that that was the case um, but that it is alleged that that was the case and that then when that happened, you know, inevitably somebody would be taken captive or killed, and then the Nina people would retaliate with their own violence against Yupik or Alutic communities as revenge. Um, either when they were actually attacking them or right after they'd been attacked, going to those villages and then attacking them. Whatever the reasons, warfare did occasionally occur, although not to enough of a degree to have resulted in large-scale wars that were displacing people. And indeed, the wars were fought in such a way um, that perhaps war is the wrong term, so much as um, skirmishes, things that didn't last very long. But interestingly, people did have um, armor as well as a variety of weapons, so people would use um, rabbit fur armor so rabbit fur uh, rabbit fur is amazing in a lot of ways as um, has been pointed out and including that um, at tight enough densities it can act as a minor repellent it's not like bulletproof but it can um, repel some things um, as well as slat armor so armor made out of wooden slats and actually some of this armor um, it was said that it could sometimes block at least it's not like you know kevlar or something but it could at least block the impact of um, bullets um, again remember kind of the firearms that were being used in the early 1800s versus a firearm being used now so yeah tight enough strong enough that they could lessen significantly the impact of the bullet and allow it not to pierce the body um, people had spears people had bows and arrows obviously people had shields um, and we should clarify what we mean by that there was sort of this large like club like object um, that would be used to like deflect arrows that were coming at you like a shield and then people very often had clubs um, some oftentimes these would be built out of a horn of like something like from a caribou or something and then a branch or a branch one of the two Sometimes with the pointy parts broken off, sometimes with the pointy parts left over, oftentimes the horn would be soaked in oil so that it would be heavier to better hit people with. So that's sort of what I wanted to say, you know, a few notes about Denina, a traditional society. I hope I've done it justice. There was a lot to it, but um, kind of weird to end it on warfare, but just kind of this beautiful... Um, system of both village and kinship of relationships that bound people together uh, and that allowed for people to uh, get along and work cooperatively and have villages that sustained themselves for oftentimes centuries right an amazing thing i want to transition a little now to talking specifically about alutic social organization or shukpiak as we sometimes say um, this is not my own particular specialty so i hope i do some justice to the topic and if not i'd love to hear people's thoughts um, but simply a few things to note to kind of compare and contrast with Denina society traditionally. So, Elutic society, Shukpiak society traditionally can be thought of as being at least two, if not three groups. So you had the Koniak group of Shukpiak or Elutic. So Kodiak, as well as some communities on the Alaska Peninsula, as well as maybe some influence on Kachemak Bay, it's unclear. Um, but probably, certainly once things got a little bit later in history, um, yes, people came from Kodiak in like the 1800s to be part of the fishing community in Saldovia, for example. So you had the Koniak, Alutic people. You had the Chugachmute, um, Sukpiak people, or Alutic people, uh, by Prince William Sound. Um, you'll recognize this, of course, from like Chugach Mountains or Chugach National Forest. So Chugachmute, Chugachmute, uh, I think that means. And then there's, it's unclear, uh, some early sources have this, a third group called the Unegkurmiut, uh, way down over almost um, getting close to like Nunwalik and Port Graham and stuff, but in that kind of area of Shukpiak traditional territory. Uh, other sources will say, no, that was just part of this, it's kind of unclear. The point is, much like Denina, Shukpiak people were not sort of monolithic, but instead there was multiple different kinds of cultural boundaries even within that big kind of Shukpiak territory. 
What I want to focus on, though, briefly, is Shukpak gender roles traditionally. Um, we sometimes use the term patriarchy or matriarchy to designate whether a society um, has more male control or more female control, um, with patriarchy obviously being much, much, much more historically common. The That is as a set of terminology, an important set of terminology, but it's important to understand that oftentimes on the ground in actual living societies, it is often considerably more complex. And Shukpiak society traditionally is a great example. So much like Denaina, um, divided into villages traditionally, um, oftentimes relatively close to each other. So Kodiak had, gosh, like well over 10. Uh, different villages on that one island. Obviously, Kodiak's a huge island, but still like a lot of different villages on one single island. Um, the gender roles, though, within those villages, um, first of all, things were matrilineal. So much like Denina society, homes were sort of thought of as owned by women. Um, and descent was traced through female lines. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, that power was held more by women than men, as we've talked about before. You can be matrilineal. That doesn't necessarily mean matriarchal, right? Uh, but it was matrilineal. Women were secluded during menstruation. Um, that could, uh, as sometimes happened in nice society as well, there's sort of this... Um, Oftentimes on a chill, there's like a side room of the home where women would go during their period. One could look at that as a very positive move, um, or perhaps a more patriarchal move, depending on how one chooses to view this. It is something that I think a lot of early anthropologists, as well as just early um, non-native people encountering native societies, would have looked at as, um, is that perhaps sort of secluding the woman, like treating it as if that's a bad thing? Um, but there's a great, there's been some great scholarship, especially since the 80s, of people bringing up that oftentimes when you have societies where this is practiced, it's sometimes sort of in recognition of the idea of um, menstruation is particularly powerful, supernaturally, and oftentimes found in society where um, women are valued how should I say it, as supernaturally level, like that women are thought of as very powerful, as leaders um, in various contexts. And so it's a little hard. How would, how do we read that? Um, women would oftentimes have um, some significant tattoos that would signal that they were ready for marriage uh, when they were ready for marriage. Decisions, that's an interesting thing. So, so all of this, right, sounds maybe more female-centric, right? It's matrilineal. This may or may not be a recognition of kind of feminine power. Um, tattoos, right? A sort of ceremonial adornment that men lack. We could look at that a few different ways. Um, and we might, we could also then, though, look at the reverse and say, well, the village heads, the, there was always a head of the village and pretty much that village head was male. Okay, well, that sounds patriarchal. But then you have to consider, well, how much power did the village head actually have? And when you read the accounts of these communities, uh, it sounds like a lot of decisions were not made by the village head unilaterally, but instead as an entire village. Something like going to war with a neighboring village is something you'd have to talk about as a village, right? And that people would have to support. And sources say that um, women in Shukpak society were often quite prominent in those discussions, very powerful in those discussions. So yes, the political figure was male, uh, but often women were very powerful in the village discussion. So that sounds like patriarchy at first and then sort of more maybe just equal. Um, all, what I'm trying to get at with this, you know, I, I use this in my lower level Alaska Native Cultures class. I kind of present a set of facts about the village head and different things. And I say, oh, like, what do you think that is, right? It sounds patriarchal. And then I present some other things like matrilineal and matrilocal and stuff. And what does that sound like? Oh, matriarchal. But when you smush them together, what is it? It's complex, right? Um, maybe I would say it's egalitarian, but differentiated, right? There's a lot of social power shared on both sides, but divided partly into different domains, and also kind of depending on the context and depending on what's being discussed. Um, a final point about Shukpak gender that is of note um, is that Shukpak society traditionally um, recognized, allowed for, um, very much so, this was not viewed as controversial, uh, the idea that people may feel um, or want to live as um, a gender other than their physiological sex, and that this was not 
terribly uncommon, and it is something that was recognized in anthropological literature. We sometimes uh, call this third gender to recognize societies, um, of which there are quite a few historically, in which um, there was a gender space other than solely man and woman uh, to be occupied, or the capacity to occupy a different gender one of those two gender spaces that one had not at birth. Uh, so yeah, that was not uncommon. So all of this then um, to suggest social order is important, right? Societies have many ways of encouraging that. And I think this kind of raises a bigger point about sovereignty. Um, Denina society traditionally, although there was no sort of one Denina government over the whole of Cook Inlet, nor was there one Shukpiak government over all of sort of Kodiak Island and Chugach, and Prince William Sound, even though there wasn't a central government, there was social order. There was a way of doing things. There was a way that villages were bound together through kinship, through slow sin, and within the kinship, within the specific villages, there was a way of keeping order. Which brings up the point that we're talking here about nations, right? We are talking about a group of people who have sovereignty over and order over a territory that control the relationships of human beings within that specific physical space. That's a that's a nation by any way you cut it, really. It's not a country in the sense that we now think of countries with a passport office and a taxing structure, but it's a nation. And that matters when we think about sovereignty and when we try to think about colonialism, right? That what happened was not solely um, an assault on a people's culture, although it was that, nor an assault on a population of a group that is now an ethnic minority, although it was certainly that, but it was also a loss of sovereignty by Denaina and Shukpiak communities over spaces that they had traditionally controlled in their own ways. And that is where I want to end that discussion.